When you get your brand right, your industry understands instantly the value that you bring to the table. You're a thought leader. You're the high achiever in the room. And you are the industry icon that everyone turns to when they need to find that way forward. Because in a world where everybody's stepping up, you need to fly. Join the Industry Icon Program with Speak On Stage. Dave Crane, welcome to Speak on Stage, and I hope you're having a wonderful day today. Uh, normally on Speak on Stage, I share with you lots of wonderful tips and ideas and ways that you can improve your business. This time, it's a toilet paper diary. I'm going to share this show with you because it was just brilliant. We broadcast it yesterday uh, with my brother from another mother, Ernesto Verdugo, and we showed you how to change the world. Uh, specifically starting with America, how you can bring both sides of the dynamic divide uh, together, get them all to play properly, and we've got a few solutions that I hope you like, which would make the world a ultimately much better place to live in. Now, if you don't believe me, then you're wrong. I guarantee it's a really good watch. You can laugh your head off and learn something. So make sure you stick around for this. Love your thoughts, love your comments. As always, it is the Toilet Paper Diaries. It's a crazy time in America, and that's why this episode of A Toilet Paper Diaries is How Do We Reunite the United States of America? Find out now on A Toilet Paper Diaries. Episode seventy eight. Wow! And, uh, it is uh, it is just absolutely insane. Uh, we, I mean, let me tell you very uh, very much how I feel. I feel that like this week has been uh, like the calm before the storm. Uh, we went through a very tumultuous time throughout the uh, election, and uh, suddenly this week was somehow quieter. But the undercurrents of what was happening underneath. It's actually very scary. <laughs> I'll tell you what it feels like. I wouldn't say it's a calm before the storm. I'd say it's like during First World War when they're fighting each other in the trenches and they took breaks at Christmas, played football in no man's land, and then went back to the battles again afterwards. It's that gap where everyone's punched themselves out. They've got nothing left. But just going, right, let's regroup. No, let's just chill for a while. We'll go back later. It's that kind of feeling. But the rest of the world is going, thank God that's over. Wow. Can we get back to business now? But as you know, and I know, it's not over yet. Absolutely. It is not over. Well, I think uh, it is so weird. I mean, uh, in the mainstream media, or as they call the MSM, uh, everybody's uh, talking about uh, Biden defeating um Trump, 306 uh, against 232. Uh, they did the recount. They had all the uh, legal issues. And still, uh, Trump has not conceded. And this is just something which is really weird because, I mean, it is a tradition for uh, uh, on a transition of power that they are going to be conceding. And they're going to say, well, you know, OK, I'm going to work with you. John McCain did it, and uh, Hillary Clinton did it, and uh, everybody has done it. I just called uh, Governor Clinton over in Little Rock and offered my congratulations. He did run a strong campaign. I wish him well in the White House, and uh, I want the country to know that our entire administration will work closely with his team to ensure the smooth transition of power. It was a privilege and a gift to spend two years traveling this country, coming to know so many of you. I wish that I could just 
wrap you up in my arms and embrace each and every one of you individually all across this nation. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I have just called President Obama to congratulate him on his victory. His supporters and his campaign also deserve congratulations. I wish all of them well, but particularly the President, the First Lady, and their daughters. This is a time of great challenges for America, and I pray that the President will be successful in guiding our nation. And right now, this is the first time in centuries that this hasn't happened, and this is somehow scary, I think. <laughs> well, it is, and it's, it's leading to a lot of different things, because I felt that once we found out who'd won, and let's face it, if Trump had won, for many people, it wasn't the answer that they wanted, but they would have just strapped in tight to deal with it. What you've got now is a situation where Trump and his, and his um, supporters are claiming foul on what's been reported by Trump's own secret service to be the best policed and the safest ever elections ever. So Russian interference, Ukraine interference, none of that, it was all stopped. This is the American people voting for who they wanted to be. And it was very close, 70 people, 70 million people are unhappy, 75 million are happier, um, but still it's not enough for everybody to be able to come back together and go, you know what, maybe we can deal with this. But there's another 70 million that are not very happy. Which are... They're not happy. And, they, and we could do a couple of different things to, to break up what people's thoughts are. It's very easy to turn around and say right wing versus left wing, but it's not. That's a spin that's been put on. Trump lost a lot of white voters to Biden. Biden lost a lot of blacks and Hispanics to Trump. Mm -hmm. Work that out. Trump gained a lot of women and lost a lot of women. So, and Trump got as many people voting for him as he did last year, four years ago, even maybe more, but Biden got more than anybody in history. So what you've got is an extra group of people coming to join the, the, the game and they all bring their own sensibilities and choices. So where does that leave us? That leaves them in the current situation where if you get somebody not conceding when you're playing by Queensbury rules, you end up with it having to go to some kind of adjudication. And that's ultimately, I believe, why Trump wanted to make sure that the judiciary was stacked in his favor. Now, the rest of the world was already turning around saying, right, Biden, we'll just, you know, we'll just make friends with Biden. Let's get the world back together again. But that's not Trump's objectives. Trump really seems to want, and this is my opinion from only my observations, but it seems a bit to be that Trump wants the battle to continue because if you delegitimize the entire system that you were in charge of, then you can make this spin for another four years. Yeah, I mean, it is. Uh, and I think this is what many people are actually saying. I mean, that uh, possibly he's going to once, uh, once and for all uh, accept uh, he's going to get into the uh, his new news outlet, which right now, this is another thing which is incredibly interesting to see. Right now, we have uh, CNN and MSNBC and uh, all the mainstream media, and then we have Fox. But because Fox called Nevada for uh, Nevada or Arizona. Sorry. Arizona. Yeah, he called Arizona for... Um, uh, for Biden beforehand, right now he's going crazy and he's actually getting everybody to go out into uh, outlets like uh, Newsmax and uh, whatever the whatever the other uh, <laughs> channels are. Um, uh, 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 OAN, I think it is. Um, but here's the thing. So right now there's a play that's being made to get an independent, a new um, champion, um, unfiltered, social media news platform to keep everybody who doesn't feel happy about legitimate laws to be able to say what they want, do what they want, add conspiracy theories and be unhampered. I think the smart play for Trump is to take over and create Trump news. He thought he had it with- A very uh, strong 
into what is happening right now. So they right now they are going into a crazy frenzy of a stolen election. And uh, right now there's no concession. How did it happen in, in the uh, Weimar Germany in, in 1918? The historical parallel that seems most appropriate today is a very dark one. After Germany surrendered at the end of World War I, ultra right-wing groups concocted the myth that Germany was actually on the verge of winning the war in November 1918, but surrendered because of a conspiracy to destroy the country plotted by certain communists and Jews. In his book, The Death of Democracy, Benjamin Carter Head explains why this stab-in-the-back theory endured. Quote, the trauma of defeat left millions of Germans believing a particular narrative about the war, not because it was demonstrably true, but because it was emotionally necessary. Hitler often raised the topic during his rise to power. In a 1922 speech, he said, we must call to account the November criminals of 1918. It cannot be that two million Germans should have fallen in vain, and afterwards one should sit down as friends at the same table with traitors. No, we do not pardon. We demand vengeance. Today, Newt Gingrich says this about Biden. I think he would have to do a lot to convince Republicans uh, that this is anything except a left-wing power grab financed by people like George Soros, uh, deeply laid in at the local level. Uh, it's very hard for me to understand how we're going to work together. President Trump retweeted this incendiary video of the actor John Voight. This is now our greatest fight since the Civil War, the battle of righteousness versus Satan. Yes, Satan, because these leftists are evil. Let us fight this fight as if it is our last fight on earth. The historian Timothy Snyder points to the danger of such rhetoric. If you've been stabbed in the back, then everything is permitted. Claiming that a fair election was foul is preparation for an election that is foul. If you convince your voters that the other side has cheated, you are promising them that you yourself will cheat next time. Having bent the rules, you will then have to break them. Can I just say one thing as a caveat for everybody who's watching this and freaking out saying that we're saying Trump is Hitler? We're not saying that at all. I'm not saying that Trump is anything like Hitler with the extreme views of Hitler or, or the, the nasty piece of crap that Hitler was. All we're saying is there is a rule book for going down this route. And the playbook is quite plain. You start calling the news media fake. You start finding victims in society who can't fight back, who you know you can make and blame for everything. And let's put this in perspective. If you were to turn around to your neighbor and accuse them of homosexuality, of pedophilia, of stealing, of anything that they don't feel comfortable with, it's really hard to shake that label once people start looking at you. So this is what a lot of the fake newsy stuff is all based on. It's based on conspiracy theories that are so outlandish, are so crazy that they must be true because how else would somebody have thought of them? If you keep piling them on top of each other, people start to believe them. And it's really easy when you base fear at the center of all this. So yeah. we're not saying that Trump is Hitler, but we're saying the playbook that we're seeing unfolding is very similar to what the Weimar Republic was going through, taking us back a hundred years ago. Here's a, um, something that I really like from this book from uh, Benjamin Carterhead. He says, the trauma of defeat left millions of Germans believing a particular narrative about the war, not because it was demonstrably truth, but because it was emotionally necessary. And if you think about what has been happening right now, uh, you, those people that still believe that uh, this is not over and that uh, Trump is going to win on the, on the courthouse, that is just fueling the whole thing to go into what we can perceive as a complete parallel reality. That's what I think. What do you think? I agree with you. I mean, thinking about the amount of banners that are going up now saying stop the steal, the idea that the left stole everything. Watching one congressman, for instance, being elected and talking about how his, 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 his dad or his granddad fought during the Second World War to stop socialism in Europe. It wasn't, it was to stop 
fascism in Europe. It was a right wing against everybody else. It was Hitler and his cronies versus everybody else. See, he was only a socialist in the name National Socialism, which became Nazi Party. That's how it was worked. So there's a blending of different and blurring of things to kind of spin a story. So if we're going to blame the left, let's pretend they're all Nazis. And in, case, in that case, it's actually said by many people that, um, that the left are fascists. I've heard that from many people in a way that they're describing the challenges of the Democrats versus what the Republicans are going through. So with that, let's look at the, the alternative realities. And you've done some work into this through your time machine, Ernesto. Where do we start? Well, I think it's just important to say, well, you know, it's not really that there's uh, uh, multiple realities, but they are different ways of seeing things. So they are called, in uh, quantum physics, they are called multiverses, uh, which is multiple universes. It's just one universe. But if you say, well, you know, if you, there's parallel realities, that, that means that there's two realities, and then you can just put them into another bigger reality, and that just becomes a universe. That's why you cannot really say that there's only one universe or two universes, because that will not really work in the way that you were thinking. So if you think about it, uh, the first uh, variation of we have of a uh, multiverse, it will be the bubbles. And uh, in this, I think possibly it's a good idea to explain it like if it will be pockets. Don't you think? I mean, I think that's just an easy way. Yeah. To it. So let's, let's, let's deep dive into that. When you have communities that like to do their own thing, then that's a parallel universe. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a parallel universe as in spacemen and stuff, but they have a different agenda where, for instance, you have communities that decide that they're vegetarian and don't like to eat meat alongside anybody else. They'll go to a restaurant and they'll look at a menu and they will not eat, touch anything if it's got meat on the menu. They can go even further if it's got anything that's of a milk or animal product, they can stop completely. And they'll have restaurants alongside McDonald's and Burger King and so on, but that's a wrong little world. You've got everything from people's religions with Amish people who don't touch anything technical, anything electronic, they live in their own community, they till the land and they have their own laws about how they do things. To American, uh, uh, Native Americans, to, to Sikhs, to, to everybody. It's natural for us to have our own bubbles. Correct. There's bubbles built in. Yeah, we have a, a short uh, video with uh, an explanation of how that works. Have a look. In physics, the word multiverse normally refers to one of three distinct and largely unrelated proposed physical models for the universe, none of which has been tested or confirmed by experiment, by the way. The three multiverse models are type one, bubble universes or baby black hole universes. This is the most straightforward kind of multiverse. The basic idea is that perhaps there are other parts of the universe which are so far away that we will never see them, or are inside black holes, so similarly we will never see them. This kind of model was created as an attempt to explain why our universe is so good at making stars and galaxies and black holes and life. As the argument goes, if each of these separate mutually unseeable bubbles in the universe had slightly different laws of physics, then by definition we could only exist in one that had the right physical laws to allow us to exist. Like, we have to live in a universe where the Earth could form, because if the Earth couldn't form, then we couldn't be here. So there we go, we've got bubbles. So effectively what we're saying is, is Republicans are in bu one bubble, Democrats are in another bubble, Trump might be in his own bubble, but the point is that um, they see the world through their own set of lenses, their own filters, and anything that's up is down in their eyes if the other people think it's up. So Ernesto, with that in mind, that's bubbles, what other parallel universes could we examine? Well, the other one would be to think of dimensions and membranes. And I think this is just a very important one. So, I mean, there's several dimensions. Right now we see there's uh, two dimensions. Like if, you're watch like if you're looking at the newspaper, I mean, if you see the newspaper, you have one newspaper that if you open it, it has several uh, pieces of uh, uh, paper, several sheets, which each represents one topic, one could be about uh, uh, sports, the other one's gonna be about the news, the other one's gonna be about what's happening in town, whatever it is. And all these things are just uh, uh, put together in front of each other and they have several dimensions. There's a, we have also a, a short video here so that you understand how that works. Multiverse type two, membranes and extra dimensions. 
Inspired in part by the inability of the mathematics of string theory to predict the right number of dimensions for the universe we observe, string theorists proposed the idea that perhaps what we think of as our universe is actually just a three-dimensional surface embedded within a larger super-universe with nine spatial dimensions. Kind of like how each page of a newspaper is its own two-dimensional surface embedded within our three-dimensional world. And of course, if space had nine dimensions rather than three, there'd be plenty of space for other three-dimensional surfaces that appeared, like ours, to be universes in their own right, but, like the pages of a newspaper, were actually part of a bigger whole. These kinds of surfaces are called membranes, or brains for short. So there you go, and I think it's very interesting because, of course, all of them are, are just going uh, on, on different slices, if you want to put it. But I think the one that is incredibly uh, accurate, because it's a little bit like if it will be uh, getting into different rabbit holes, which is a word that we keep on hearing from the matrix, and what we keep on hearing that everybody goes into a rabbit hole, is the uh, quantum physics uh, uh, version of it. So possibly, Dave, you can tell them a little bit about it. Well, I can, because I can put my science fiction head on. When we start looking at the multiverse and the many universes, the idea is that we've got lots of things happening alongside. And when you put stuff into your perspective, you make one particular universe come to life. So, for instance, if you look at Groundhog Day, one of my favorite movies of all time with Bill Murray, he has different experiences of the world going through again, again, and again, as if it was playing the same experience. Then you've got a movie, one of the original ones I saw a long time ago with Gwyneth Paltrow, I believe, in Sliding Doors. And the whole movie was based on the idea that she was running for a train and she missed it. And so she didn't make it to the meeting. And so all the things that happened were different because she had to go home. I think she went home and found her husband was, or boyfriend was having an affair. If she'd gone to work, he would have had the affair and she would never have known. So it had split screens all the way through about if she'd got the train and if she hadn't got the train. Another example for you is if we take the Marvel Universe and what happened with Infinity Wars where they all went back in time to change the reality that they have right now, Doctor Who, all those things. So we've got experiences about and theories about multi-universes all existing at the same time, and that whatever you choose to do at any different time takes you into a split decision where you could have gone left or right, and whichever one you choose lets one different type of universe appear to you. Multiverse Type 3, the many worlds picture of quantum mechanics. Surprisingly, physicists still don't fully understand how the collapse of the wave function in quantum mechanics happens, and the many worlds hypothesis makes an attempt at explanation by proposing that every possible alternate timeline for the universe is real, and they all happen in an ever larger, ever branching way. Like a universal choose your own adventure where every possible story happens. If this were the case, we might not realize it because we'd be stuck living out just one of the infinitely many possible lives available to us. In some ways, Many Worlds is similar to the bubble multiverse model by proposing maybe anything that can happen does, and we just happen to exist in a series of happenings that were necessary for us to exist. It's very complicated, but that's quantum physics. I don't understand it, but I know it's there. Yeah, well, the, the, I think the only point is that we have to see it in that way, because right now, some people are seeing, okay, well, you know, this is the direction that we're going. And there's an alternative reality with other people are going. And now if we see it in America, we have 74, 75 million people that uh, have one way of thinking. And then we have 72 people which are uh, thinking completely different. And they are going into two different realities, two different rabbit holes. So how is that going to be affecting the world? Well, I think that right now, the rest of the world doesn't really pay attention to American politics in the same way as Americans are. We all followed, and I'm based in Dubai, as you can see from my backdrop there for the windows. Um, we followed everything that was going on with, with Trump Biden, but then a result came out. And for most world leaders, they're saying, yeah, it's just right, here we go, right, we're gonna be dealing with Biden. That's fine, they say. And Biden has chosen to not fuel the fight. Remember we talked about the rope dope where he went yeah. up against the ropes in, in politics and just basically took the hits until Trump punched himself out? He's doing that. Now the challenge is, if Trump doesn't go to jail, he can carry on punching and his family can, and his friends and the 70 million voters can carry on punching. How long do you ignore that? Or can you address it? 
or we, are you really going to reunite America? Now, we're going to be talking in a few moments' time about exactly what we suggest you do or they do to reunite America, but it's going to be interesting to see because the world is kind of moving on. The world would be very surprised to see that this, this powder keg in the US blows up into something more substantial, like even a civil war, because we've all got our own issues. We've got coronavirus to fight. We've got economics to deal with. We've got the re recession that's biting every industry, digitization, running people out of jobs and having to reskill the entire planet. We've got the mental health issues of the second pandemic of people just being scared and paranoid and lonely and depressed. The idea that we spend another four years staring at America means that we just really have got better things to do, no offense to Americans. But let's take this back to the Weimar Republic. When Hitler took over and he used paranoia and he blamed the Jews and he blamed the socialists and he kept it going all the way through, what happened with the rest of the world couldn't stop it happening. So they tried to appease it. Most famously in the UK, holding up the bit of paper that said peace in our time. I've met with Mr. Hitler. He signed a, do a document saying there will be no war. There'll be peace in Europe. And of course, shortly after he invaded Poland and everything exploded. I don't see that right now. I yeah, see that this is still very American. Yeah, it is very American, but it is something that I think everybody should be concerned about because uh, historical correlations always, you know, they always tend to play back one way or the other. They have been playing back every single time. And uh, if we see what has happened in, uh, in the uh, 1930s and what is happening now, there's a lot of correlations because right now, the fact, and once again, we are not saying, well, you know, Trump is Hitler or we are not saying anything like that, but we are seeing that divisiveness that needs to be changed. And one of the things that, need, that we need to think about is that moment that uh, we have a new president here in the United States, there's going to be that bugging voice whether it is in another in Trump's news, whether it is going to be the 72 million people uh, talking about it, that parallel reality is not going to go anywhere. So we might have a cancer, which is actually going to be uh, growing into, into the world. And uh, it's going to start enrolling everything, or we might have to look for an alternative world. And I think, in fact, if you're talking about parallel universes, also you can have alternative endings. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, those books that uh, you go and uh, you can choose your own adventure. And uh, I, I love them. I used to love play like Dungeons and Dragons, but you can choose A, B, C or D and a different page to turn to depending on what you chose. Yeah, correct. Uh, Robert Spear used to say that uh, it was much better to actually have people educated and help them understand how, how things was that just keep them in the in the dark. And if we keep on, you know, we don't have a common understanding on what is going on in the world. I mean, we are not going to a very nice place. Let me say two things that we've got to be very careful of. When you use a term like cancer, yeah. I think that we're misrepresenting the thoughts of the people who are voting for Trump. Yeah. They are legitimate. They want jobs. They want their industry to survive. They feel really worried about all the immigration that can take away the jobs that they're barely holding on to. They don't understand why other people should take what they've had for generation after generation. They're not cancerous. They're just scared people who right. believe that they had a champion who's just been lead, who's just been cheated. So we have to be very careful about that. Yeah. The other thing is. Um, when we talk about the world view, we also have to talk about the number of Trump allies around the world who are using the same original playbook. You've yeah. got to look at Brazil, you've got to look at Mexico, you've got to look at, to a degree, at Britain, and you've got to look at a number of different places, the Philippines, where you've got leaders who are real sort of power men who are using the strong arm, look at me, I never lie, I don't bleed, tactics, to split the countries and get themselves into power or stay in power. That's, that's a number of things around the world we have to consider. I'm, I'm very happy that you actually brought that because when I, when I started talking about the cancer, what I think the cancer is, is the uh, misinformation. I think it's the divisiveness. 
And that is exactly what can definitely mesthetize size, or how do you say it? Anesthetize? <laughs> no, mesthetize, when actually the cancer starts growing. <laughs> oh, it, it can increase and it can grow and it can, it can well, it will just basically um, increase is, is, is a term I'd use, first of all. You're right. This is what the, the cancer, if we're going to talk about it, is caused by the fact it's not dealt with when it's small. Yeah. That's the bit that we're looking at. It can infect. And the infection is not necessarily the ideologies. Yeah. It's the divisiveness. Absolutely. The fact that you believe that your way of thinking and the opposition's way of thinking uh, cannot exist in the same universe. Yeah. Because let's face it, you need to have Republicans. You need to have Democrats. You and need to have somebody who turns around and tells you you're full of shit. I, I was having a conversation with a common uh, Republican friend uh, that we have. And one of the things that I was telling him is, you know, I am not red or blue. I am purple. I believe in many things which are very similar to what the uh, Republicans think, but I can also understand a number of things about the, the, the Democrats. So if we put it into Republican and uh, Democrats, I think we can also say conservative and that uh, we can also say uh, liberal. So I, I believe in, in two things. So for example, I am pro-choice, but I am about small government. I am about a limited amount of taxes. So I am in both ways. So this has nothing to do with politics. This has nothing to do with uh, the way that we're thinking. And we absolutely, we need both sides. We need the conservatives and we need the, the um, uh, liberals because right now what can happen, and this is one of the things, for example, which I, I already can predict. Uh, right now, the uh, Lincoln Project, the Lincoln Project where people were Republicans that were against uh, Trump, basically the personality, but right now that they have elected Biden, the Lincoln Project, people like uh, Mitt Romney and uh, uh, John Kasich and all these guys are going to be back to be Republicans. They're not going to be Democrats because they have that exact mentality. There's mourning in the Republican Party. Today, senators and congressmen are waking up to the reality that Donald Trump has broken their party. They praised his mistakes instead of heeding the warnings, then blamed others to cover up their president's failures. With the economy in shambles, people across America are still unemployed, one of the worst economies in decades. This November, hundreds of Republicans are up for re-election, and with their goodwill run out, many have given up hope. Republicans worry their re-elections won't survive Trump's presidency. There's mourning in the Republican Party, and under the leadership of Donald Trump, their party is weak and scared and powerless. And now, many are asking, if we have another four years of Donald Trump, will there even be a Republican Party? So what is very important is, you know what, we complement each other. And I think uh, for me, the nicest example about this is uh, we were watching Bill Maher the other day, Dave and I, and uh, we started watching, uh, what's the name of these two guys? Uh, Gwen Stefani um, in a relationship with Brett, what's his name? The guy that was off The Voice. The Voice, yeah, exactly. Let me yeah. find out. You keep talking, I'll find out what his name is as I just Google Yeah, it. So, so basically, I mean, he's as hard core Republican, as uh, you can imagine. And she's, of course, a, a Hollywood celebrity. Blake Shelton. Blake Shelton. Blake Shelton. There you go. So once again, I mean, we, we have to. I mean, and we can live together. This is my whole point. We are not enemies. I don't see Republicans as enemies. I don't see uh, the, the uh, conservative as enemies. And I also, I always have to explain people don't see me as a, as a extreme liberal because I'm not, I'm purple. But you are not a liberal. <laughs> I am not, no, 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 not. absolutely not, no. And here's another thing. One of my heroes of all time, and I didn't know it until after he'd passed, is John McCain. Yeah. Oh my goodness, the guy would have made an incredible president. The Absolutely. guy during his life was so principled, so powerful, really cared about his country, about the good in people. He didn't see color, he just saw integrity. 
and he was a Republican through and through. And when he mentioned about the, the, um, the Lincoln Project, I welcome the Lincoln Project going back to the other side effectively and going to the Republicans and saying, right guys, this is our party, let's regroup, let's leave the charge, let's get back in in four years. Yeah. This is not, because what happens is you've got lots of good people, but when you've got this going on, it's very easy to sweep in seeing the weakness and grabbing the feelings of people and doing something with it. Yeah. If you look at the, the fads that we have, Gangnam Style or Macarena or the Birdie Song or any of these things, the music that suddenly grabs the world and go, oh, well, let's all do it. They do it because there's something needed at that time. Yeah. Why would a guy like Psy with Gangnam Style suddenly end up with like a billion views, more than that, and everyone able to do that crazy dance? Is because at that time we needed something that just was mad enough for the world to play with. So yeah. maybe this is what we need, Nesto. Maybe the answer to this is we look at some way to bring everyone together. And then after that, let's look at some good news. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a way to see uh, things together and not separate. For example, it's been right now quite sad what has been happening right now on social media that they are saying, well, you know, I don't want to be in Facebook anymore because, of course, they are. I am getting all this uh, liberal media, which is whatever. So I'm going to go to this other platform, which is called Parlay. And uh, basically that creates more divisiveness. And that is not exactly what I we are preaching and what we are saying. Just think about it. One um, in March 12th, 2020, we started this role on the Toilet Paper Diaries, basically reporting the news of what was happening, all this good news feeling. And uh, it was a project that we thought that it was going to last uh, a month, possibly two months. We are right now <laughs> way past month number eight. Very likely we're going to go into one entire year. And this makes me think about uh, one project from one of the uh, very famous um, uh, YouTubers, Markiplier. He created uh, Unus Anus, and he did something incredibly interesting. Just does, that st does that stand for one bottom? <laughs> one Anus? No. <laughs> that sounds like, a, what's his name? Uh, Bora, no? In the Anus? <laughs> Hello. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, it's one one year. So let, have a look at this video so that you can see what this whole project is about. We live our lives taking each second for granted. But what would you do if you knew how much time you had left? Unis Honest. One year. This channel, much like all of you, has a limited amount of time. And every day, we march ever closer to this channel's inevitable doom. That means we'll be uploading every single day until the clock strikes zero. And then, it's game over. Bye-bye. Finito. Finished. Curtains. Gone, gone. Night-night. Dead. Forever. Make no mistake, this doesn't mean that we'll just stop uploading. When time runs out, we will be deleting this channel and every single video on it. And you'll never be able to see them again. Because much like death, you can't take it with you. And all we'll have is the memories that we make along the way. And the merch. So the clock starts now. But the choice is yours. Will you join us? Or will you miss out on your one chance to be a part of Unis Anis? Because time is already running out. The train is already moving. So subscribe now, because death is coming. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. Ring the bell for thyself to know. For there are no second chances. And if you miss out, all you'll be left with is regret. Memento mori. We'll see you tomorrow. Unis Anis. What a great strategy, Ernesto. From that, what we'll do is once we've done a whole year of Toilet Paper Diaries, let's delete every podcast every episode let's go underground well we're in lockdown anyway so it feels like underground anyway and let's see if the world can live without us
That is correct. Well, you, you know, know what's going to happen? Nobody's going to give a shit. Nobody will know. Exactly. But you know, the funny thing is this has really catapulted these guys uh, tremendously. But in reality, what I think is very interesting is if we put this whole year into perspective, that we have been uh, basically reporting the news, how the whole thing has been changing is just absolutely uh, insane. So we are right now in a, in a place where we started united because at the very beginning, we were, oh, you know what, let's just cook bread and let's just be nice with each other. And now suddenly it's like complete revolution. So the important thing is how can we bring each other together? And that's exactly what this uh, show was supposed to be about. Well, here's an answer to it. And it's something that when I was doing uh, motivational sessions in public with real people and not just online, uh, I talk about the win-win negotiation. Now, this is championed by Stephen Covey in his he Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So what it breaks it down to is that it's also used by the United Nations to, to use when you've got two warring nations who hate each other or two communities that hate each other for whatever reason. What you do is you get a sheet of paper. I'll just get a sheet of paper now to illustrate. So here's one sheet of paper, and I can't tell you what's written on it. Oh, somebody's phone number. I'll take it upside down so you can't see. So then you split it down the center, and right across it, you write somebody's name here, one side, and somebody's name over here, the other side. So you've basically got a diver diversion between the whole thing. You turn to the opposition side, and you say, what do you want from this whole problem? What is it you really want as an end result? And you write down everything they say. We want this, we want that, we don't want this anymore, we don't want that anymore, we want to add this and add that. And you say, anything else? And we go, no. Oh, yes, there is. We want this and we want that. And you write it all down. Anything else? No, that's it. Good. Well, let me tell you what I want. I need this, 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 this. And you write down what you want. Now, the thing is, until you do the win-win negotiation, you think that they're against you and they're watching you and they're doing stuff to take you out. And it might be there's a conflict directly, but the odds are they just want their own thing and it has nothing to do with the, the, the um, clash points that you think they are. So now you've got a list of what they want and a list of what you want. It's important to ask them first so they feel that you're listening to them. If you say what you want first, it's part of an argument. And I said to him, would you mind meeting with me to see if we can resolve this? Because if we go to court, it's going to cost us hundreds of thousands, us and you. And you know that. And let's meet without lawyers. So we met together, me and this gentleman. <clears throat> and I, I sat down and I said, help me to understand how you see the situation. Let's try to resolve this. If we can, that's fine. We'll go to court. He goes, oh, OK, I'll give it a try. So he was sitting down and I got up on the whiteboard and I said, help me understand how you see this. He said, oh, well, this is how I see it. And this and this, I wrote down about 15 items. And then I said, is there anything else? And he said, yes, this and this. And then I just walked through and I just repeated back everything he'd said um, so that he knew I understood. And I, I asked him, do you feel like I understand you? And he said, yes, I do. And it changed me because for the first time I could see his point of view clearly. He was right, we were violating parts of the agreement. And uh, I was influenced by this. And then I said to him, would you mind if I shared with you the same way you shared with me about how we see the situation? And he said, yes. And he was open to my influence because I was open to his. And so I walked through on the whiteboard all the things that we were, we were sensing and seeing. And I believe he was deeply influenced and said, I understand. And uh, the, the spirit in the room changed. It was suddenly, Mutual understanding, mutual benefit. Uh, we suddenly got into brainstorming about ways to resolve this. And in 30 minutes, we came up with a solution um, around us getting back our IP over a long period of time. It gives them time to, to adjust at a fair price. We both felt really good about it. <clears throat> it was a remarkable feeling because we started advocating for each other's position. And we left the meeting, shook hands, we resolved this. The whole thing took about an hour and 15 minutes. And he called me up a week later and said, hey, do you want to go to lunch? <laughs> and I said, sure. And during lunch at one point, he goes, I always knew your family were good people. <laughs> and that's what's needed here. Right now, there's a ton of problems that the right 
I say the right, the Republican voters really feel they're going to be ignored. The, the left or the Democrats, and I hate saying left and right because that's not clearly true for, for most people, yeah. but they want certain things to happen as well. So why not bring out exactly what everybody wants? And what do people want? We can name it now. I want my family to be safe. I want to earn. I want to feel, se- feel, feel that um, I've got a future and I don't have to deal with other people's crap anymore. And I want the virus to disappear so I can go out and not wear a mask and breathe proper air. And I want everyone to just get off the news and let me watch something boring of my own choice for a while. Yeah. That's not asking too much. That's where I would start. And that's not a partisan problem. It's a let's bring everybody together. And I believe if it was done properly with a real referendum and you acted on it, you'd end up with a united or at least the steps to create a united America. That is absolutely correct. I mean, it is, uh, but it's not going to go by having all these uh, uh, divisiveness and trying to see, well, you know, seeing each other as, as enemy. I mean, uh, just right now, uh, New Greenwich was uh, talking about, well, you know, it's going to be impossible for Biden to actually uh, work together because all they're going to be doing is they're going to be blocking him or having this guy, John Voigt, uh, uh, the father from Angelina Jolie, saying things like this. Have a look. The left will bring you down with their lies and destroy America. This is insane. I mean, the moment that you have people which are doing all these different uh, things, that is just going to take us nowhere. So I think this um, uh, element of the negotiation is better. And you know what I really like, uh, Dave, from this whole year, from this unus anus. <laughs> One bottom. One bottom that we uh, that we have uh, spent here together in the toilet paper diaries. Uh, we have seen some amazing things that people have done together, and that keeps us happening. I mean, uh, right now here in uh, Houston, it was very beautiful. I mean, there's a local candy store, which is owned by a, and this is really incredible, so that you can see that this can happen. He is 90 years old. He is... Uh, veteran, he is a cancer survivor, and he is a uh, Republican. And uh, right now, he has a, a very beautiful uh, candy store, which he said, like, if it, it is at the beginning of the century. This is Don Baker. Don, Don Baker, Baker, yeah. Don Baker, the, the candy store, the candy store owner. Candy House. Candy House. That is correct. So just have a look at how beautiful uh, it was the entire Woodlands community supporting him. Look at that crowd. Yeah, guys in the community heard about those tough times that this business is facing and they wanted to step up to help them out. Take a look behind me. That is the line that has been this way for the last couple of hours and it does not look like it's slowing down anytime soon. An outpouring of support as customers line up for a candy shop in the Woodlands. Everybody's trying to help out. We support our local businesses, and that's that's what we're trying to do here today. Can I have uh, probably six? In a shopping center along Glenlock Drive, the Candy House has been here for over 20 years, but as of late, business has been a little off with the pandemic only making things tougher for the owner, 89-year-old Don Baker, a veteran and cancer survivor. Some days great, some days slow. That's the way it works in a little store like this. After a recent conversation with a customer about how things have been, that customer took to social media asking for the community's help. That post has since gone viral, shared thousands of times. I don't think there's any other word to describe it besides pure joy. We saw this, we were like, we need to come, we need to support, we need to support local. There's even been a GoFundMe page set up that's already raised thousands of dollars. It just brings tears to your eyes. It makes everyone so proud to live in a community that will come out and support someone. It's, a, it's great. I never planned this in my life. Baker says the amazing show of support will certainly go a long way, making the community's effort to help him a sweet success. I'm overwhelmed. I can't say anymore. It's, 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 I'm overwhelmed. That's a beautiful story. And the Woodlands community, I can see in the backdrop through your window, that's all the people waving at us, millions of people who all contributed to, to Don Baker and the candy has. Of course, we had a similar story in the UK with Captain Tom Moore, who walked around his yard uh, and raised, what was it, 55 million pounds for the, the um, NHS, the, the health service in the UK. Another wonderful story. You see, the thing is, Ernesto, there's some beautiful stories. If you can get people to come to the table and share love 
and share goodness, you'll realize that on both sides, there are good people. Absolutely. Who have the basics there that they want everyone to be successful. Absolutely. Doesn't have to be at the expense. Yeah, there has no, I mean, we all have the same things. As you were saying, we all want the same uh, the same things. I mean, one of the things, for example, that for me was also very touching, and also it's a very important thing for my wife, is uh, the fact that uh, right now so many uh, people here in the U.S. because of the lockdown have been adopting for uh, foster dogs. And uh, we all want that. I mean, we're all human beings. And uh, it, is, it is beautiful to see how people are cooperating in a very nice way. So are there nice things? Absolutely. We just need to go for those nice things instead of actually focusing on the divisiveness. And you've got to look at the coronavirus as directly being responsible for making people think differently about stuff. Let's take Cray Crayola, for instance. Now, whenever I used to grow up and I used to cr crayon and create stuff, when it came to drawing me, I either had to be dark brown or black or orange or some color. There's never a skin color that could cover me. But now Crayola have launched a box of crayons that accurately allow people to do their skin color. Now that might seem like a nothing thing, but trust me, if you're of color, it's effective. Just like the fact that you can get plasters now for brown people. You never had them before. Because if you're white and you've got a plaster on, people might not see that you've hurt yourself. But if you're black, you've got this great big thing across your hand that says, I can't shave properly, or I've done something silly. And so just the pointing things out has made things better already. Yeah, that's awesome. And also, for example, I mean, the, the uh, first heroes of the pandemic, it doesn't matter in which side of the aisle you were or what your ideology was, everybody was adoring uh, the incredible work that the uh, people in the, for example, in England, the NHS or for here, uh, all the people that were working in the hospitals right now that we are picking again on the second wave or third wave, or I don't even know where we are right now. All these people are the ones which are changing, uh, changing us. And they don't care if you are Republican, they don't care if you're Democrat. And that I think is also something that is, uh, it's uh, just absolutely amazing. And I think those are the things that we need to focus a lot more. I mean, I've got to look at the whole thing from the big picture, which is if we hadn't had toilet paper running out of stock or the, the idea of toilet paper running out of stock and people talking about using B-days and so on. And if none of that had happened, we wouldn't be talking now on the toilet paper diaries. Take us back eight months ago. We decided we'd do something. We tried to brainstorm the names. I can't remember the names that we turned down. But the toilet paper diaries made sense at the time and make <laughs> zero sense now because we would never run out of toilet paper. There's not people walking around scared to bite their nails because they ran out of toilet paper, but the name stuck. And in fact, your fingers would have if you didn't have paper in the first place. Yeah, with the toilet paper diaries, I mean, all what we have been trying to do is, you know, have a different perspective. I mean, our idea, we have had some complaints of people, oh, you know, you're taking the show too political. And it's not really that we want to take it political, but what happens is there are things which are just developing and they are happening. But our idea is to make sure that we bring joy, that we bring understanding, that we bring, that, that we bring education. And uh, the idea is we are all in this together. We're all a big happy family in one uh, one single world. I mean, right now we're living in a world, and this is another another thing that uh, it doesn't choose if you are Republican, if you're Democrat, or whatever it is. Look at school. I mean, all these kids going to school uh, on a digital way. Uh, now, right now, we suddenly realize how important teachers are and how much we have to really uh, thank them for uh, taking care of our kids. And that is exactly another example of how important it is to uh, make people uh, happy and understand that we're all, all in this together. Wouldn't it be interesting to see if after the pandemic and people start making TV and movies again, that we start seeing more movies about teachers, more movies about healthcare workers, and less about cops shooting people as a direct result of a different consciousness taking over. Right now, the idea of a guy with a gun like Bruce Willis running through or Sylvester Stallone has been there for forever. Cowboys before that. But it'd be nice to see if a, a caring world and real stories about people that help each other starts becoming a thing. And talking about that, 
For me, the biggest joy out of all of this whole experience has been my family, spending quality time with my gorgeous wife, my beautiful daughter, my dogs, and the ongoing love-hate relationship we have, like the world's funniest soap opera. I was going to say it's like the Cosby show, but then you've got to look at Bill Cosby. It's not that. <laughs> it's the cranes. Let me give you a little glimpse into what happens in the crane house. And here we have my beautiful this wife, Aziza. This is what he my made beautiful me. Daughter, I, put Maya. Her, I put chocolate syrup on it, and that's what my dad made me. That's I, it. Yes, that's a burnt pancake. Deserved. A burnt pancake. Now, people talk about during the uh, lockdown that nothing happens, but Maya, you cooked all this breakfast, didn't you? Didn't you on your own? Mm hmm. And how grateful is mommy? The only one that I didn't cook was the burnt one that uh, my dad made. Shut your face. How. how, how <laughs> How grateful is mommy? Hmm? How grateful is your mother? Extremely. Oh, well, tell extremely. us then. Say to the camera. Say how extremely grateful you are. I am extremely grateful. Now, how do I break Look into the camera when you say it. I'm extremely grateful. Right. How do I break the crown? <laughs> Which bit should I cut? The queen. Which one? Well, the as one soon as you do the, break it, I'll just doom, get the crown. The one okay, that I accidentally okay, put a doom doom on top. What's a doom doom? I don't know. So how do I cut? Do I cut it this way or do I cut it this way? You know, I don't know, it doesn't matter. There's actually a really good idea for this and it's called, I couldn't give a sh how you cut it, so right, just go I'll and eat it. Fold it. You've done it the wrong way! <laughs> <laughs> go on, missus. She's breaking her crown. You, is this the first one you've eaten? Yeah. It's like watching somebody eat for the first time. Mmm, <laughs> yummy. Eat that, mummy. Mmm. Very good. So She's because the first one after I decided to make mini pancakes. Mm, mommy chews like a because camel. Because there wasn't much left in the packet. And verdict, mommy, is it nice? So she can do it next time? All the time. Okay, good. Well, we run out of pancake mix. Maya, get in the car, go to the shop and get some more. You get it. Fill out the form first. All right. Love you, bye. You get it. How about you get it? You shut your face. Just eat your pancake. Bye. Babe, that's strawberry. You might not sweet. Love you, bye. They're not sweet. Doggy? They have, I told them, Snow. they have bruises all over Tell them. them. Try it. No. Try it. No. Open your gob. Give me one. Open your gob. Give me one. Open your gob. Take it. Take the whole thing. You know, that's that's lovely. That's a lovely clip. I mean, this re reminds me of a lot of stuff that happens uh, here. I mean, of course, uh, Maya's a little bit younger. My kids are a little bit uh, pretty much in their little bubbles because, of course, my daughter is into uh, Ariana Grande and uh, BTS and K-pop and uh, my son Vincent is into his trombone and my, and my wife, John, is into the dogs. And I am right now doing all sorts of things. And But, you know, at the end of the day, every single day, we come together at 6.30 in the evening and uh, we, have, uh, we have dinner and we talked about our own experiences and uh, we at the end, we love each other. So in my eyes, it is perfectly fine to think differently. It is perfectly fine if you don't agree with me. It is perfectly fine if you, are, uh, you have conservative thoughts and I might not have uh, the same conservative thoughts. We can all, all agree to disagree. What we cannot tolerate is absolutely the divisiveness and the destruction of the world because of a lack of understanding. And this is- I exactly agree with you. I think ultimately the antidote to all this is exactly as you say, thinking about ourselves as a global family with lots of disagreements, lots of challenges, but at the end of the day, we spend all the time on the same planet. So when it comes to it, let's just stop the fighting. We can go back to fight again later, but see it as an argument don't see it as the end of time. And that's how we bring together America. That's how we reunite the world. And that's how you and I can turn around and say, maybe it's time we stop making the toilet paper diaries. Until then, you and I are going to have our hands full. Yeah. And people can keep watching. Yeah. Dave, once again, it's been a great honor doing this beautiful episode with you. I love it. You know what? If the world sorts itself out, Let's just keep doing the show anyway, because we've got to find something out there that we can talk about. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed the show. Look after yourself. Catch you soon on the Toilet Paper Diaries.